Hello and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. This is a frontline update for the 5th of January 2023. I've put out a lot of content in the last few days. Hopefully I won't run out of steam. I'm going to do another Ukraine war update extra video this afternoon or come out this afternoon. I'll record it this morning. One came out earlier this morning because I, I don't know how to tell the time and I scheduled it for the afternoon, but obviously I didn't. So you're going to get extra content. There's so much to talk about. Anyway, let's try and move towards the front line. I'm going to give you the overnight news first. Let's go straight to the reported losses that Ukraine produced for Russian losses. All the caveats. Uh, go and look at my previous videos if you want to know those caveats. 810 liquidated personnel. So that's an uptick, and that's probably reflective of some of these big hits that that we've heard in Makivka and other places. Um, Chekhovka. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about HIMARS hitting all over the shop so that's going to be indicative of that three tanks two apcs 12 artillery systems that's definitely an uptick and a very useful uptick two mlrs also useful uh one aircraft fixed wing aircraft one helicopter interesting two drones 14 vehicles and fuel tanks and one piece of special equipment you might see that tanks and apcs things like ifvs are a bit low on the ground compared to maybe, I don't know, three months ago, four months ago, and you'll probably be right. Uh, that's uh, reflected here. Here's a loss of APCs, IFVs, of AFVs, armoured uh, fighting vehicles. Um, well, actually, no. Uh, yeah, so tanks, APCs, and IFVs. So in September, there were 350 odd losses, and now we're down to 116. So the idea is it's not that the Ukrainians can't destroy the tanks, it's just they're not using so many of them at the more at the moment. Three times fewer tanks destroyed in December than September. That is arguably because they just don't have them. They're just not as um as used, as available uh, uh near the front lines. We're starting to see smaller groups of troops. Uh you look at Bakhmut, it's a very heavily infantry orientated offensive from the Russian point of view. They use very little mechanized equipment, the Wagner PMC in that area. And that could be why we're seeing figures like this. Um, so yeah, moving on to HIMARS, the amount of uh, firepower of single HIMARS transporter, erector, launcher, TEL can generate in a 24 hour period is incredible. Uh, so he's done a back of the back of a napkin calculation, which is one high miles TEL. If it was shooting sort of twenty four hours a day, obviously that's not going to happen. Shooting GM GM Gimlers at ninety percent accuracy would yield one hundred seventy three targets destroyed. Now, obviously, uh, if you fire all of your pods at one target, that's going to look quite different. Uh, all of your pod at one target, that's going to like look quite different take then that and apply it to all the front lines. So let's just have a look at Zaporizhia last night. The Ukrainians um, uh, took out Russian positions in Tokmak, Melitopol, Berdyansk, Polohi, and Vazilivka. Why hit frontline positions with five to 10 soldiers, like I was telling you about in Bakhmut, when you can hit two to 300 at a time further back? The losses of officers, supplies, and equipment slowly adds up. So here's a map of just some of these hits in Zaporizhia, going to, all the way down to Berdyansk. And I pointed out yesterday or the other day that that is out of HIMARS range as well. So what's hitting that? Is it the Turkish uh, Gimlers that was provided that has 150 uh, kilometer range? Could could well be. But if you add up the damage that this is doing over a prolonged period, this is surely hammering Russian logistics, capacity and capability over a sustained period. And that's going to hurt the Russians. Um this is an ex so when you start looking at numbers like this, you go, oh, look, three tanks, two APCs. How do they know that? Where are these figures coming from? Is that really what's happening on a daily basis, et cetera, et cetera? And then you look at this Kadarovite video. So this is from a Russian uh, Chechen fighter, uh, TikTok warriors. This is their base getting hit, right? So if this sort of thing is happening on a nightly basis, just have a look at this video. Yeah, then. <laughs> So here's a base, right? You have just seen a video flash past about six vehicles, all destroyed. Well, let's count them. Uh, one vehicle, two, might not be six, three, four. Yeah, it looks like there's about six vehicles. It's difficult to tell because there's so much wreckage. 
And that is that is an example of what is happening on a nightly basis. That's artillery, apparently. There's not even high Mars or um, you know guided missiles. So there you go. And as a result of that kind of thing, you can see if that's a fuel truck there. It could be others. Uh, as a result of this, Russians are looking to adapt. This is pretty clever, you know. Uh, hats off to them. So this is uh, disguised to make a fuel truck look like a logging uh, vehicle. And I think that's a pretty clever disguise, the sort of thing that you would absolutely want to be doing. I would not I would not have said this for some time, actually. I, I would not want to be someone driving one of these around. You know, right from the beginning when we were seeing Bayraktar hits and all sorts of hits on like fuel vehicles and, and such like, I just I wouldn't want to be a tanker. I wouldn't want, want to be in a Russian army, but there you go. Um, so, yeah, that's a good bit of adaptation. As we see here, you know, one uh, KA-52 attack helicopter, uh, one fixed-wing helicopter and a drone. So a good night for uh, the Ukrainians against Russian air um, equipment there. Now, on the flip side, Jan on the January 5th update, the general staff also reported that Russian army launched at least three missiles, uh, 13 airstrikes and over 60 MLRS attacks against Ukraine targeting its civilian infrastructure in Bakhmut, Kost Kostantinivka, Kurokhova, Nikopol and Kherson. Nikopol and Kherson, so Nikopol gets hit. Uh, I do often say this, but Nikopol and Mayanets get hit every night and just, oh, goodness me, it must be pretty horrible there. Uh, but these other places are a bit of a worry. We're starting to see Kurokova and Konstantinivka being mentioned quite a bit. And these are sort of behind. One of them is, you can see it just up there, it's just uh, sort of back from Marienka. And the other one is here, just back from Bakhmut. And that, to me, signifies that, you know, the Russians are doing you know, tactical strikes on important positions as as they should be, you know, given they're an offensive army. This is the kind of attacks they should be, not on civilian infrastructure, but on, on targeted points uh, that are important logistical hubs for the Ukrainians. So Konstantinivka for Bakhmut and Khorokhova for um, Marienka. So th that is what they're doing and, you know, lots of other sorts of attacks. Now, this is... Uh, it, it, interesting news as well this is a british intelligence update and they say that uh, on december the 27th uh alexei danilov secretary of the ukraine's national security and defense council reported that russia had relocated long-range aviation so their 295 ms bear the heavy bombers and the 222 m3 backfire medium bombers to russia's far east on the 5th and 26th of december the Engels airbase was struck and several aircraft damaged. Russia has highly likely responded to the incidents by conducting a general dispersal of LRA aircraft, especially to airfields further from Ukraine. So while they say that this uh, affects, so we go to my Google map here, while this might affect uh, the kind of logistics and the maintenance of these aircraft, so they're moving some of these aircraft away from, say, Engels and Saratov, which is here, and they're moving it, out of range of these drone attacks on the one hand you might think yeah that that's that's pretty good and it's going to upset their logistics and things are more difficult on the other hand these have got 5,000 kilometer ranges these missiles and so that's not really a big problem uh, but it is it does just it's, it's a bit annoying I guess for for the Russians and I wonder whether it will also give the Ukrainians a longer warning period if they can a track that these aircraft are taking off and they are further away and they're releasing missiles i don't know whether they have the radar capacity to uh, or capability sorry to track the the missiles when they're over here but they might well have longer warning and be able to prepare for uh, the saturation missile attacks when they do happen um there's uh, quite a lot to say about uh shahid drones uh, and stuff so uh, Ukrainian strikes are reported. Uh, sorry, no, no, wrong, wrong, wrong. So uh, apparently, talking about sort of missiles and saturation attacks, Ukrainian uh, military intelligence has said on January the fourth that Russian forces have used 660 Shahid 131 and 136s, these are Iranian drones, since September 2022, and they're absolutely romping through them. That's because if they use fewer of them, they just get taken out and they don't have as much use. So they need to use quite a few, a lot of them at, at any one time. 
but still with a 100% shoot down rate, which has recently been the case, the Shahids are still able to damage Ukrainian cities. I've had some pro-Russian trolls on my thread saying, well, what explains this explosion? Well, what happens is when you shoot down the drones, quite especially with small arms fire, quite often the warhead is intact and they fall to the ground and wherever they fall, that warhead's going to explode. So even if you shoot these drones down and you have a 100% shoot down rate, it, they can still present something of a problem. Um, let's go to Budinov. So uh, who is Budinov? Uh, Kirillio Budinov, who is Ukraine's military intelligence head, had a big old interview with ABC News. Lots of stuff came out of this. Let's give you a little bit of synopsis. He added uh, attacks would come deeper and deeper inside of Russia, but would only be able to comment on his country's responsibility for the attacks after the war was over. Interesting. And when asked about attacks on Crimea, which was illegally annexed in Russia in 2014, Budinov said Crimea is Ukrainian territory. We can use any weapon on our territory. So, yeah, nothing we don't know, but it's just to say that you can expect all the weapons that, that Ukrainians have access to to be used in Crimea. Soldiers showed me a section. This is what he says. Uh, when he went to Bakhmut, soldiers showed me a section where dead bodies were uh, are piled up like something you would see in a movie. He said there are hundreds of dead bodies just rotting away in the open field in places. They are piled on top of other bodies like makeshift walls. When Russian troops attack on that field, they use those bodies for cover like a shield. He continued, but it's not working. There are actual fields of dead bodies there. I've seen uh, examples of fields absolutely littered with dead bodies. I've seen some just some horrific footage which i can't show you however i think the kind of tactics that wagner and russia are using around bakhmut is causing problems in bakhmut i think north uh, we'll go on to this later but i i think things aren't looking great for the ukrainians around bakhmut budinov said russia's weaponry is depleting forcing it to resort to cheaper more plentiful solutions like the iranian made self-destroying shahid drones which have sowed fear and panic in the population. Uh, he goes on to say they are expecting US Bradley armoured fighting vehicles to be sent to Ukraine soon. So this is almost certainly going to happen. It's looking like it's going to be in the next package. But Joe Biden said yesterday's yesterday, I think. Um, I, there's so much cool vehicle, so many cool vehicles and different stuff that's been given to Ukraine that's been announced yesterday. I've uh, loads to tell you in the uh, extra video later. We are waiting for them, he continues. We're looking forward to them very much. This will significantly improve the combat ability of our units. Budinov said he expects fighting to be the hottest in March, adding that Ukraine is planning a major push in the spring. So this is what attracted a lot of attention, the, these claims. This is when we will see more liberation of territories and dealing the final defeats to the Russian Federation. This will happen throughout Ukraine from Crimea to the Donbass. Our goal, and we will achieve it, is returning to the borders of 1991. Really explicit on that. So that's very interesting. Not in that article, but in the interview, um, he also says that Putin is terminally ill, he will die before the war ends, and there will be a transfer of power. He, they, Ukrainian intelligence has said this for a long time. Uh, US and UK intelligence at times have said this could be the case, and other times have denied this. Danish defense intelligence explicitly said Putin wasn't terminally ill only a week ago. I wrote an article on this some months ago. You can find it on Only Sky about whether Putin is ill. He has definitely got something. I'm almost certain of that. Um, I, I, there's going to be psyops going on. And in, indeed, a denial of this could be in the best interest of the UK and US psyops. Or it might not be true that he is terminally ill, but there's something going on. He has some health issues. There's so much information out about this. And when you look at the behavior of Putin over the last couple of years and through the uh, pandemic, you add all these uh, bits of the puzzle up, and, uh, and I'm certain there are there are some serious health issues with Putin. Whether he's terminally ill and he'll die soon is is another matter. I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, we got mobilized uh, Russian base on fire, um, sort of thing that we see when all these Russian troops appear to smoke. Uh, so much. Uh, another bit of news, Estonia is the first, intends to be the first in Europe to transfer frozen Russian assets to Ukraine. So that's really good. There was talk about this from Germany. They wanted others to do that. Well, here you are. Uh, the Estonians have done that. You can possibly follow suit. Last thing before I get to the front lines is... The Russian MOD has shifted, this is according to the Institute for the Study of War, American Think Tank, has again shifted the rhetoric and format of its daily situational reports. Sit reps 
likely to flood the information space with significant claimed successes and distract from its significant military failures. The Russian MOD instituted this shift on January the 3rd, doubling the length of its previous sit reps and focusing on claimed strikes against Ukrainian military assets that often lack operational significance rather than its largely unsuccessful ground attacks. These sit reps focus on small settlements and group strikes to by target type rather than location, making it difficult for its audience to geographically orient the sit rep and and verify the claimed strikes. The Russian MOD also dedicated multiple telegram posts to featuring a new mi missile cruiser uh, carrier, sorry, the Admiral Gorshkov. You might have seen that in the news, and it's very unlikely to conduct operations uh, supporting Russian forces in Ukraine. Obviously, it can't get to the Black Sea. A performative measure similar to those that Russian mill bloggers have recently criticized, as ISW has previously reported. The Russian MOD had previously attempted to em emulate the Ukrainian general staff sit reps in response to widespread military blogger criticism of the lack of transparency in official war coverage following Russia's military failures in the fall of 2022. When you put all that together, say I did that big old analysis. I know some of you are like, you know, it's too long and I got some criticism, but I wanted to go to town on the analysis. Uh, on analysing the the reaction to the Makivka. So the Makivka bombing was a huge uh, PR loss for the Russians. Military bloggers and certain uh, people in the echelons of, of command in Russia have gone to town on criticising Russia and the MOD for what happened in Makivka. So they came out and did this um, strike on uh, Druzkivka that they claim took out five high Mars, four vampires, eight cars, 200 uh, personnel, and so on. But it, it appears that's complete nonsense, as, as my analysis showed, or at least, at least, almost certainly largely long, nonsense. And this uh, then fits into the kind of remit of flooding the information space with claims uh, that, that it takes. I mean, there's something called Brandolini's Law which is the asymmetry between unpicking bullshit is the, you know, I think law of bullshit or whatever, where if, if a claim is made, nonsense claim, and it takes seconds to make that claim. I've, I've spent the last 12 years of blogging and article writing, trying to unpick nonsense people, people, nonsense claims people make, but it takes me like 10 times as long to unpick the nonsense than it does to claim it. Like, it takes you 10 seconds to, to on Russian television to go, this is what we've done, there you go. It takes me an hour, two hours to put together stuff to say, actually, that's not correct. And so the effort involved to unpick this nonsense is asymmetrical. Anyway, flooding the information space, therefore, with incorrect claims, and you could claim that's the case for both sides, is, uh, is kind of an easy potential win. Anyway, let's get on to the front lines. That was a long news intro, but there's not a lot of mapping news. I'm going to go to the northeast, Kupiansk to Svatovod to Kremina, and basically very little detail coming out, so much so that Noel Reports hasn't even done any maps today. Um, Defmon says that there's a uh, repelled attack towards Stena Makivka, which is the same as always. No news from up north near, near uh, Kupiansk. I had done some map changing last night. as up till very, very late doing some map changing. Uh, it's interesting that... Three Ukrainian map sources. So ISW have a really good interactive map. Uh, Live UA, uh, which is the kind of Ukrainian official one, and then Deep State, uh, uh, which is an unofficial one, but pro Ukraine, all kind of pro Ukrainian. ISW is obviously kind of objective, but will be marginally pro Ukrainian. Um, all have like different. Uh, mapping for certain areas so for some the man per she is under ukrainian control for others it's not and for the russians it's not and so it's i you know some of these will look confusing because it looks like both sides control it's just it's so difficult to get uh, reliable information um i've moved a lot of the lines around here back uh around ploschanka and sorry, uh, no, further down south, around Ploschchenka and Chivona Papivka along the P66 or R66 highway, depends how you transliterate the Cyrillic. Um, Ploschchenka and Chivona Papivka are now kind of, I put as grey zones. There, There is constant shelling around there, but I think Russians have been hassling the Ukrainians quite a lot around this area. And you hear about repelled attacks, but I don't, I, I don't know that it's right to say that the Ukrainians fully control this area. 
so I'm just leaving that as a big grey zone for now. Um, and also that's potentially the case in this forested area. Dubrova is a place where some people say Ukrainians control it, others don't. Defmon's come out and said he's geolocated some fighting, some uh, the Russians attacking the Ukrainians northwest, 2.5 kilometers northwest of um, Dubrova, which means he says it's unlikely then that the Ukrainians control Dubrova. It's more likely it's just a grey zone. Some people have said it's just empty. Uh, it's you know, there's been so much fighting over some of these places. Like, what does control a bit mean? And is it useful to control it uh, in when looking at other tactical implications? Uh, some mapping has actually the Russians all the way down in this forest area. Although there was talk about fighting so close to Kremina, uh, it's been rather quiet on the operational security front here. Uh, so it's difficult to know 100%, but this could just be a big old grey zone here. Bilirivka, there's been um, repelling of attacks around there. So Defmon says um, in the Kremlin area, the Ukrainians repulsed an attack in the area of Bilirivka. Uh, again, he's talking about the geolocation around Dubrova. So, uh, yep, Russians are trying to take um, Bilirivka, but it is it is holding out. There's just consistent fighting there. Uh, in, just south of the forest and then really we're going to come down to the Bakhmut area just before I do Bakhmut I just want to say something about this whole region as a as a whole so apparently according to Ukrainian command uh, they've successfully taken out um, with I think HIMARS strikes uh, Russian ammunition warehouses and whatnot and depots in Svatova uh, and they've done that to such a degree that apparently the Russians are now having to ship equipment to the kind of frontline area directly from Luhansk. They're not sort of dropping it off anywhere because the Ukrainians have um, done such a good job there. So uh, Russian forces now deliver ammunition to the grouping in Sata area directly from Luhansk city because U Ukrainian forces defeated Russian attempts to build warehouses in Svatova. Um, OK, let's move to Bakhmut. So my opinion is that things aren't going particularly well in the area. Just starting up at Spirina. Spirina's got, a, it might have some underground uh, tunnels around Spirina, which is why they're finding, the Russians are finding it difficult to make uh, advances, continued advances there. But if we come down here to Yakolivka, Bilirivka, Yakolivka, uh, Solodar, it's all about Solodar just at the moment. So Yakolivka, I've changed my mapping quite a bit to reflect some advances the Russians have made. I've also put a large area of grey zone uh, where the Ukrainians are really on the defensive. Um, there are attacks towards, oops, there are attacks towards Yakolivka, uh, sorry, Vaseli and, uh, if I haven't done that, uh, Krasnohora. So this is showing that the Russians are making decent advances, um, but it's solid out here. So apparently, this railway station here, Dekonska railway station, Solidar, which is quite a long way from the actual extended front lines I'd already given here, has been has been taken by the Russians. So here we might, I, I don't know exactly what that's going to look like and where they've come from here, but certainly that is, that's pretty much being confirmed by uh, a number of different sources. So that railway station is certainly under their control. Not sure about this. Apparently the Russians are, uh, finding it difficult that these salt mine areas this uh, sorry the salt mine area has um a uh, has underground tunneling around it and the ukrainians have been able to pop up behind the russians and sort of make use of that uh which has, has caused them a, a bit of problems a few problems krasnohora attacks towards their sorry i'm right problems with uh, Google Earth at the moment. Attacks towards Krasnohora, I think this is big old grey zone that uh, probably represents Russian advances. And as I say, um, advances towards Vesele as well. In fact, Krasno Polivka, they've, uh, I didn't have the Russians, the Russian line was back here yesterday. I put it further on here. As I say, it, it's uh, the salt mine here is is giving the Russians a bit of a headache. Um, because of the, the tunneling, extensive tunneling around that, but the so Solidar is not looking good. And this is your key to the north, not only for Bakhmut itself, but for this road, this lo these logistical routes into 
Bakhmut. The closer the Russians get to that road, um, the more difficult life is going to be for the troops in Bakhmut. So, yeah, I would say things are looking difficult north of the, the town. It's interesting that the ISW says here, uh, reporting what the Ukrainians say, commander of the Ukrainian ground forces, Colonel General Alexander Chersky, uh, stated that Russian forces failed to meet their command's deadline of capturing Solidar and encircling Bakhmut by December the 26th. So it's kind of trying to sell this in as good a way as possible. It's, yeah, yeah, but you didn't get this by the time you said you would. Yeah, but it still looks like they probably will be in control of Solidar fairly soon. Um Yes, it's it's going to be difficult and they will, will lose a lot of troops, but they don't really care about that, it seems, Wagner and the Russians in general. Um, if we come east of Bakhmut, I've changed the lines here as well. The Russians are actually back towards this road. Uh, the Ma uh, What is it again? The Maximenka Street. And there are differing claims about this waste plant. Uh, so I've got it under uh, control of both of them. I, I'm not 100% sure who controls that, really, um, because of the, the conflicts uh, in the sources. But the Russians are, it seems, in control of this industrial sector on Patrice Lumumbi Street. Uh, and as I say, have pushed up to, um, to this road here and may even have a little foothold in these eastern suburbs again towards the north. Uh, again, pushing closer, uh, the aggregates now definitely in control of that and possibly this rubbish tip. There are uh, conflicting reports there. And uh, Opitni, so Ivanhrad seems to be entirely under the control of the Russians now. Some claims that they control the whole of Opitni. So remember quite recently, the, the Russians were pushed out of Opitni, broadly speaking, or largely. Um, in, a, in a Ukrainian counteroffensive, well, there's ebb and flow. And could this be ebb and flow? Or do the Russians have some decent uh, grasp of these settlements now, such that the Ukrainians really are on the back foot? It could be that that is the case. Uh, I've moved the Russian lines further forward or through these fields as well. And I've moved the Ukrainian lines back to represent this kind of grey area. He's uh, Klischivka as well. Uh, this there are high, there's higher ground in Klischivka here, here and at the back, and it could be actually that I was unsure of where the assault from the Russians took place. It might have actually been in the middle rather than this northern area, uh, but they were had uh, they struggled to get uh, to maintain a foothold, or at least it's difficult to maintain it because of the the areas to the north, the south, and the west. You, you know all. Firing on this this part, this Shivka reporting in Ukraine did uh, a piece on that. If you want to go and check that out, um, so Klishchivka again, the, you know, repulsed attacks. Kudimivka, Ozerinivka. I think the Russians have a little bit of um, control over this land to the west of the canal here around Ozerinivka. ISW does have the Ukrainians doing a counterattack, or it has at least them claiming they've done a counterattack and are in control of the this northern part of Kudy Mivka and going out here along the canal. Um, I've not re reflected that in my mapping, just completely unsure of exactly what's going on there. But that's that's the situation in Bakhmut. Apparently, there are reinforcements uh, in Toretsk, in Chazyv Yar. Um, there is there has been talk as well that the Zaporizhia offensive counteroffensive this one that that could well be you know attacking down to as I've talked about many times before you know the Ukrainians are looking like they could um, oops what have I done fingers uh, are looking to do this offensive to do something like that uh, down to the Azov Sea and cut the land corridor in two. Uh, some sources are saying that was planned to have happened by now, but it's not happened because there is an accumulation of Ukrainian forces there. It seems like most sources agree on that, but it seems like they've had to send reinforcements up to Bakhmut from here. And in, indeed, Sumi, uh, I think there's some reinforcements and Sumi that's just, just gone in there. And that indicates that uh, Bakhmut is, is a bit of a problem. And I've often said it's fixing Russian troops. Well, actually, it could be the Russians fixing Ukrainian troops. And it is enabled or is 
not enabled the, the Ukrainians to do their much sort of vaunted uh, counteroffensive in Yapor- uh, Zaporizhia, arguably. Uh, that is just one theory that's out there. Anyway, let's move south of Bakhmut. But actually, just before I do that in true Colombo style, I have to read this from the ISW. It's super important about the whole uh, Bakhmut thing. Uh, Continued Russian offensive operations around Bakhmut, particularly claims of marginal tactical gains around Solidar, are not incompatible with the ISW's standing assessment that the Russian offensive in Bakhmut is likely culminating. I talked about this over the last week a lot, how they are running out of momentum and troops and steam and, and capability and capacity, arguably. Spokesperson for Ukraine's Eastern Group of Forces, Colonel C. Chiravati, stated on January 4th that Ukrainian and Russian forces clashed on the ground 22 times in the past day and that Russian forces conducted over 238 artillery, MLRS and tank strikes in the same period. The Ukrainian Border Guard Service shared footage on January the 4th that shows Ukrainian journalists driving into Solidar without fear of Russian fire. Ukrainian soldiers in the video near Solidar said that Russian forces changed tactics and now throw infantry into battle without preparatory artillery fire and that Ukrainian forces shoot 15-person Russian infantry groups from 20 metres away. This apparent change in tactics suggests that Russian forces in the Solodar Bakhmut area may be intensifying attempts to gain ground on a tactical level but remain unlikely to secure operationally significant terrain. The culmination of an offensive does not mean that all tactical activity will cease and such activity could even increase in intensity but the activity is unlikely to produce meaningful results. Continued Russian tactical operations and claimed gains around Solodar do not preclude the likely culmination of the ongoing offensive. So you could read this that the the Russians have lots of troops, but they don't have the artillery and the uh, the rest of the mechanized equipment and the MLRS to to pound the Ukrainians. It's just throwing in waves of humans. What they do have a lot of at the moment, maybe, but how sustainable that is, it, it, uh, are boots on the ground. So they're throwing them uh, and gaining ground in certain places. But the question is, is that sustainable going forward? You know, operationally. Anyway, sorry, lots of talking. Let's go to Avdivka. And actually, it's going to be very quick. Very little news out of Abdika. Positional fighting going on. The same goes on pretty much for everywhere else down around there. Uh, so in Donetsk, uh, Defmon says, you Russians are doing what can be described as banging their heads against a concrete wall. Um, uh, there you go. Uh, and in fact, you know, Rebar, um, all my usual sources say virtually nothing about Abdivka and even Marienka. Uh, no real information coming out about Marienka. There's a little bit to be said about Zaporizhia. Uh, Rebar says here on their map, um, uh, and I find this quite interesting, and I wonder whether they've done this or whether that really is a, the Ukrainians. Uh, but they they talk about, so those are bridges there. After the Russian withdrawal from Kherson, Ukrainian command focused its attention on the Zaporizhia region using already proven tactics. Uh, Ukraine is striking the rear Russian facilities, well that's true, breaking logistics and complicating Russia's supply system as much as possible. So they're quite open with accepting this. Uh, this is what makes me a little bit, uh, that's odd. In addition, sabotage and recon groups are used to, to disable bridges and crossings. Judging by the geography of blasts and strikes, Ukrainian formations will attempt to cut off certain settlements and chew off smaller areas near Vasilivka and Polohoi. Uh, fighting near Bakhmutivka somewhat slowed down the implementation of the Ukrainian plan. Some brigades were transferred to Bakhmut in order to hold back the Russian offensive. That's what I said as well earlier, uh, and I didn't get that sort of the, from this source. Uh, but as early as this month, Ukrainian command expects to begin the active phase of the counteroffensive. In other words, they think yeah, it's going to happen down here, but it's been somewhat slowed down by having to move troops to Bakhmut. But they are doing the kind of destroying the logistics and doing all the softening this whole area as they have been doing for months now, uh, such that you know it'll be ready for a big counteroffensive. So the ISW says of those uh, Zaporizhia hits, hitting a command post, wounding over 260 service members, destroying up to 10 pieces of equipment. I think that's in Vasilivka, but other places here as well. So we're going to go on to Crimea, and there is a lot of talk about Russian uh, forces reinforcing northern Crimea. So they are sending troops to northern Crimea. They are building up their defences here. They're building up defences in Kherson. The idea, as some Ukrainians are saying, is that this is because they likely see uh, Ukrainians eventually attacking Crimea and getting to Crimea. Uh, there was some rumours yesterday about uh, Russians 
demanding there's a you know pulling people out from the left bank of of the river i don't know that there was any truth in that in the end um but it, it could be that they are setting up for there to be an eventual you know armed defense of crimea as they expect ukrainian troops to reach there they're obviously expecting this land corridor to be cut off or at least the ukrainians to attempt this um so what we've seen in uh crimea there was uh, so quite a lot of activity over Nizhnegorsky, um occupied Crimea. Uh, where there were reportedly expos explosions and whatnot. Now, when you look at actually the videos of this, there was um, anti-aircraft uh, activity going left, right and center all over the shop, just firing everywhere. Which I, I find quite interesting. They are literally, I don't know if that just signifies that they're just blindly shooting in the air, don't know what they're shooting at. And then a big explosion on the ground, right? That was definitely a ground explosion. So something was hit there. Um, that's without doubt. Um, and again, you know, from another, another angle. And then that explosion again. So, uh, so something hit there. Who knows what it was? Um, but there you go. Uh, that's the end of my um, frontline update today. Sorry it's long. There's so much uh, news to give you and so much more. So please check out my Ukraine War Update Extra video, which should be jam-packed full. Thank you so much for your support. I did a lot of content yesterday. Please check out the interview I did, or not interview, the chat, I, I, the discussion with um, a, a conservative Christian. I'm a liberal atheist, and we discuss, but we agree on Ukraine. We're both Ukraine bloggers, uh, vloggers, whatever you call this. Uh, YouTubers and um, we we came together and we discussed that and I thought it was really interesting please check it out on my uh, A Tippling Philosopher channel that you can find in the channels below uh, all the other ways that you support me I really do appreciate that thank you I'm going to give you a big shout out in my extra video later anyway thank you so much take care bye bye